This episode of the Switchcast is produced by Joe Thompson, our honored patron and Switch Knight. Hey everyone, I'm KC. And I'm JV. <laughs> this is the Switchcast, the podcast for the Switch enthusiast and for the baritone co-host in all of us. Uh, I guess I guess you're happy to hear JV's back, I guess, kind of? <laughs> uh, and I, I, I can't keep are, that up. <laughs> are, do you have, can't. like, voice envy? Do you wish you had the deep voice of Run Jump Stomp? <laughs> Oh my gosh, his voice was so deep. It was like, I could feel it through my headphones. <laughs> and I don't know, I just don't feel quite as adequate as that, Casey. <laughs> as you should, as you should. No. <laughs> I'm happy to be back, uh, finally. Last week was torture for me because I was out on vacation doing non vacationy family things, and Ether was going on, and I was watching it all while out of my own household, so I couldn't really record anything. And I have so much to say. Ah, and we're going to give you a chance, because honestly, like, people listen to the show not just to hear me. They want... You're, you're JV. You're the guy that they want... You're, that at least half the people here want to hear the opinion of. Know. And and, it, and we have to let you get a chance to catch up at least briefly on what you thought of everything we, we saw at E3 this year for Switch. Right. I'm not going to tread over all the things you said before, so I'll just uh, run through all the stuff we talked about and give my quick opinions on them later. Yes. I'm even going to commandeer a whole section for it today. Yes. And you're you're and I'm going to try to shut up as much. I'm not going to even try to interject. I had a whole episode without JV to interrupt my brilliant things to say so i can back off and give jv his more uh limelight this episode while he <laughs> goes over it all oh man i'm having a performance envy not performance <laughs> envy a performance anxiety here Ooh. we have a lot of new listeners compared to before yeah that's the other thing we got to have to wait we have to uh welcome this episode a whole lot of people i guess just e3 fans or people who just pay attention during this time of year found the podcast over the last week it was actually our most listened to 24 hours in the podcast history uh last friday yeah which is you know kind of a shock to them now that they're listening to another co-host instead of a deep soothing voice <laughs> so half of them hear this episode and they're like oh this isn't what i thought the show was i'm unsubscribing and the other half were like Oh, I don't like this co-host guy. I'm not listening to their next episode. <laughs> well, we're, oh, so we're going to lose every one of those lose, listeners. Lose. Yeah, just we're going to lose, lose for us, either Casey. Way. <laughs> but honestly, um, it was so much stuff, and it, it, was, it took so much time to watch all of E3 that I had to get a bit of a tech detox last weekend after E3 was over, and after I finished work, I ran off to the woods. I went camping. I, I turned off my phone except for a little Pokemon Go here and there. And yeah. we just kind of, you know, the missus and I just, you know, we, we, we spent a weekend of camping, kayaking, and hiking, kind of just rebooting my system, you know? Right. So uh, I'm inundated with tech, so I'm never in a position where I need to tech detox. Essentially, tech is my detox, so <laughs> I'm just... Absorbing all of the E3 hype, and I just want to take this and run with it until the games come out. You know, we are so different and similar that I just, I, I have to know. I'm really curious to hear your take on some of this stuff. So let's just get right to JV's words of wisdom. Oh, I don't know if they're going to be wise, but I do have some words. <laughs> Alright, JV, this is your segment. This is your time to shine. So you just take this away. I'm just going to sit back and maybe prod you with a question here or there. Okay. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on E3 since you had a whole other episode dedicated to E3 in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the last episode. So I'll just run down all the topics that you covered in the order that you covered them and give my two cents. Are you ready, Casey? I'm so ready. All right. So let's start with Rocket League. So, 
when Rocket League was announced, I thought it was so awesome that was it was finally coming to the Switch. I always felt that it was a perfect game for sharing the joy. And as I stressed in the past, I believe, since professional players use the controller, it'd be perfect on the an on the go platform to play the game and practice. So okay. th- this is a great platform to actually maybe go pro on the Rocket League circuit. Which do you is think it, really unique. Do you think it works well in tabletop mode with the small screen? Uh, I think it's just fine, honestly. It's not. It doesn't really require that much field of vision, though. Of course, you always want a bigger screen for this type of game, but mm-hmm. you gotta have a few concessions, and that's one that's relatively negligible for the portability. Okay. All right. So next one, Metroid Prime Four. All right. I'm sure this was the biggest surprise for everyone, and there were a couple of concerns that the Rare team isn't back to actually make the new Metroid Prime, but I'm pretty confident that they can recapture the magic of the game since it's a long time coming and Nintendo's had a lot of feedback since then to consider what people liked about the original series. So Metroid Prime 4, incredible announcement. We've been missing Metroid for a while. I'm so happy for this. Would you rather it have been a classic style Metroid game, or do you totally prefer the first person shooter Metroid series? Oh no, um, I'm hundred percent glad that they're bringing Metroid Prime back because that is Nintendo's first person shooter game. They don't have one other than Metroid Prime, and now they're bringing it into the consoles, and it's great. I love it. So what's Splatoon then? It's a third person shooter. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Come on, they have definite. I, no, it, 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 you are technically correct. The best kind of correct. <laughs> technically correct is the best kind. So, uh, next one: Fire Emblem Warriors. Uh, watching the videos, I loved the little touches that make it really feel like Fire Emblem. The gameplay is shown, and it seems perfect for the franchise. Since it already feels like you're fighting through swarms of enemies in the main games anyway. Right, yes. So, now that they're bringing it into an action game, and there was even a bit of a clip showing people's stats leveling up the way Classic yes. Fire Emblem is. Right. So, just the little touches there. I'm excited to see it. You, uh, you loved Hyrule Warriors, Casey. And yes. I think Fire Emblem is an even better franchise for the Warriors type of game. And I know you purposely didn't listen to our conversation, so you wouldn't be spoiled in any way, but that, right. this was the title I said was the one I was most excited about. Uh, oh, really? Okay. Yes. For all the reasons you said, you know, they even have, what is it, the weapon triangles involved in there. Yeah, isn't stuff. that so cool? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And the setting is perfect. Now, the next one, the Yoshi game. Mm-hmm. Of course, Yoshi is as adorable as ever, and there's always a, a baseline quality for Yoshi games, so I'm not particularly concerned that it's going to be bad. Um, there are a certain subset of players who love this type of game, and uh, it's it's great that we finally have one for the Switch in console form. Not 100% too excited about it, but I know people like Rin, she's going to eat that up. Yes. <laughs> Okay, now, next one, Elder Scrolls Skyrim. Okay. Uh, Obviously, we all knew that this was coming, but it's actually really cool that they added a bunch of features to make it stand out Mm -hmm. in a Nintendo platform. It kind of felt like they're milking the franchise a little bit, since they're double-dipping with their VR offerings on other consoles. Mm -hmm. But having a portable Skyrim is worth it. I feel like... A portable Skyrim is more valuable to me or to us as Nintendo Switch players than a VR neutered version of Skyrim. You know, I'd be very curious, not that I would spend a whole poll on this, but I would be curious to ask our listeners how many Switch players or Switch owners have played Skyrim on other systems in the past, uh, just to get an idea of what the market interest is. Right. I feel like it's... It's uh it's going it's going to be quite a bit of overlap. Skyrim is relatively old. There has been quite a number of re-releases already, but it's long enough since the initial release that people who are clamoring for a port- portable version of this game might mm-hmm. pick it up on the Switch. So oh. uh, I I've been intentionally holding off playing it again because I want it on the Switch. That sounds excellent. That's it. Yeah. I I I I've almost played it. 
I almost borrowed it for PlayStation 3 several times yeah. from friends at work who just at the last minute were like, yeah, I thought I'd be done with it by now, but I'm not ever going to be, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's... Sorry. The sheer replayability of Skyrim is why it's so perfect for re-releases. You can play through it and then mm. play it a, a whole new playthrough and it might just be a different experience and you might just discover new things. Are there different races or something you could play as? Yeah, there are. There are different races, so... yeah, I know some of the other games in the series had, like, like what was a DLC where you could play as, like, a vampire or something, and now the right. game plays... Or a werewolf, and now the game is... A pretty different scenario now they actually worry about like full moons and stuff. Right, exactly. And that's in Skyrim. And I'm, I'm okay. pretty sure that's going to, all of that uh, DLC is going to be in this port. Outstanding. Now, next one Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. Yes. This was a surprise to a lot of people as well. And I actually know a bunch of colleagues that were immediately sold on this game. Mm. It's a quality XCOM style turn based strategy game. And those are a dime a dozen. So this looks like it'd be a fun and thematic offering in that genre. Mm -hmm. I do have to get something off my chest. Uh, yes. I will never call out someone's name for this sort of thing. But just someone in our community did refer to this game as shovelware. Uh, and that's oh. – Yeah. It was right after the trailer. And – I was, I, you know, it was some. It's someone I respect. They're generally pretty, you know. They're 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 not like just trolling. And then I just looked at this and I was like, there is no way this is shovelware. This is this looks like a sharp, polished spin on the the franchise. And right. I I just I just had to get this off my chest that I was really angry. At the person after, who said that after the fact. I, I feel like it really isn't shovelware, especially if you watched the Ubisoft conference segment for the, the reveal of this game. They had Miyamoto walk out on stage, yep. talk about the accolades of the game. And one of the, I guess, heartwarming moments is that the, I guess, one of the lead designers or developers of the game was on this on the crowds and while Miyamoto was talking about his game and giving him accolades about it he was actually in tears yeah. about how proud he was that he was able to contribute to the Mario genre with his his rabbits his, his little rabid creatures yeah so i feel like this is more of a passion project as opposed to just shovelware just as someone to trust you with the Mario franchise. The most valuable franchise and video game icon. For someone to give you that, you know, their baby, you know, like that is the most valuable gaming property I, I can imagine. Maybe someone might tell me, oh, well, this is technically more. But honestly, just that trust and then to hear the creator say, basically, we have given our trust wisely to you. It's just, yeah, I'm sure he was working on this whole game nervous the entire time. Like, am I doing Mario justice? Right. I, I kind of understand the skepticism since, you know, the Mario and Sonic at the Olympics games are kind of shovelware-y. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this specific case, the way it's presented, the way the developers talk about it and express their love of the franchise, I think it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. It might not the gameplay might not appeal to everyone else. Yes, right, right, right. But you know, I think it's going to be a quality product. Uh, we'll see when it actually comes out. Yes. Now moving on, uh, Kirby. I'm so yeah. happy that there's a Kirby game. It's Kirby's as adorable as ever, and I've never not had fun playing multiplayer Kirby with people. It's it's not going to be a big heavy hitting game like Splatoon, Mario Odyssey, or Zelda, but Kirby games have almost always been solid and fun experiences. There always has to be that uh, more casual, upbeat platformer out there for those that type of audience. And yeah. Kirby fills that role pretty well. Yeah. I'm not sure if I interpret it right, but it looked like it was the first time I've seen four-player for, like, the main story mode of the game. As far as I remember, it's usually been just two players. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're bringing a four-player multiplayer might be special. I, yeah. There might be one that we're missing, but 
I feel like four player multiplayer for the main game itself is special. Yes. In the in the past it was always either like the boss rush mode or some versus mode. Yeah, exactly. Or a side mode like mm-hmm. the Super Smash Brothers clone for Kirby. Right. But, you know, it looks it looks solid. It looks fun. It's I'm glad that it's not going to be on the 3DS. Mm-hmm. Anyway, moving on, Zelda DLC Packs 1 and 2. We already knew what Pack 1 was. I like that Pack 2 is focusing on the champions in the game. I I figured when I was playing the game, they really stood out as interesting characters, though we didn't really see as much of them as I'd have liked. Right. Yeah, other than, what, the memories and when you go to fight the, you know, sacred beasts. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So I'm glad they're exploring and expanding on them in Pack 2. And honestly, the amiibos look incredible also. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you guys are in the Discord chat, please, if you see them in stock, I really want them. So uh, <laughs> ping me uh, immediately and then I'll do what I can to hop on those. But even without the amiibos, I think it's a good direction for the DLC packs. Uh, if they explore different aspects of Hyrule in further DLC, I think this is a it's great. Let's mm-hmm. just extend one of the best zelda games in years yeah so sure (laughs) now moving on xenoblade chronicles 2 when i watched the video i i honestly thought it looked about as epic as the original xenoblade chronicles and xenoblade chronicles x so i'm super excited to see this franchise thrive under nintendo i'm just you know so glad that nintendo is continuing to promote the xenoblade chronicles franchise since i remember they were originally so hesitant to put these games out in America. Do you remember that? On I, the Nintendo Wii? I did not fo- no, I, I did not follow Xenoblade. Right. Not since what was it Xenosaga. I think uh, that was the last time I paid attention to the Xenos. Attention Zeno to anything series. Xeno related. Yeah, basically. Oh, this is definitely different. I remember when it came out in Japan, it had an English ver- dub and they released it in Europe, but they never released it in uh, America until way later in the week life cycle i'm just so glad nintendo's recognizing that people love this franchise and they're gonna just support it through and through and if you think about it i'm also really happy that nintendo finally has a full-fledged sci-fi fantasy jrpg Mm -hmm. under their umbrella i guess if they can't have fantasy star or um What's the other one? Star Ocean is the other sci-fi RPG, yeah. sci-fantasy one I can think of. If they can't get one of those two series, I, maybe I, I guess uh, Xenoblade is the next best thing I could try to play. And it's it's great that Nintendo is spreading their IPs a bit further so that they are covering different genres. Mm-hmm. Metroid Prime, FPS, Splatoon, competitive third-person shooter, Xenoblade Chronicles... Sci-fi fantasy JRPG, you know, etc., etc., etc. I think this is a really good plan for Nintendo. And if you're just going to stay under the Nintendo umbrella, they're really trying to cover all of their bases and give you a very wide array of genres under their platform. So, mm-hmm. good job. Thank you, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. It looks awesome. Now, next one, uh, Pokemon. Okay. I'm also incredibly relieved that they confirmed a core Pokemon RPG for the Switch. Yes. Since, yeah, that was a bit of a hiccup people had during the Pokemon Direct reveal. <sighs> that was all we were really hoping to hear about. I mean, everything else, I mean, like, Pokken was something that, at the time, I was just like, oh, Pokken, that's cool. I, I will say that I, I watching the tournament... Where Matt Pat actually, yeah, our, our you, the game theory guy. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah that was I great remember. watching him win the oh, tournament yeah. there. I had a lot of friends who uh, are really into Smash Bros. Mm-hmm. Um, I had them watch the Pokémon Tournament Invitational, and they had Nairo, which is one of the big Smash Bros. players, compete mm-hmm. in it as well. And a lot of those people got just as hyped about Pokémon Tournament as they do with Smash. And seeing that excitement and people recognizing that this game is competitively viable is awesome to me. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to see people adapt uh, adopt this as an alternative fighting game to Smash. This this is probably, after seeing the tournament and kind of getting a real understanding of how it works, 
It is the the fighting game I'm looking forward to diving into right now. The most. Yes, by far. Right, and I'm so glad to hear that because I I, I think I brought this up. I've always been hyping this game up to you, KC. Like you every, have every single time I could mention it, I brought up Pokin Tournament all the time. And I'm happy that you're convinced that it might actually be good. For yeah, you. no, I, I, I didn't know all the little extras it had. I didn't know about the two different phases of combat that it does. It mixes in. Uh, seeing the high level players play it, uh, that will always. I, I think I have a pretty good eye for understanding the underlying strategy of things like that. And when I saw them competing at the highest levels, you know, possible, possible right now. Right. yeah. Uh, I I could see, like, I can see where I aspire to reach and that it's not something that's, it's not about the muscle memory combo-y thing. It's about the reading, knowing the timing, and that whole positioning game going between the two modes just really intrigued me. I, I'm very pulled into this combat system. Right. And it's also just such a pleasure to watch because of how spectacular it seems, but it's not too spectacular, but you can't follow along with it. That mixed into the fact that it's Pokemon that, and you can have your own connection to the characters based on that Mm -hmm. and seeing all the moves translate into this new type of genre. It's, you know, there's a lot going for it. Now we came to a certain conclusion as to why they made that announcement about the mainline Pokemon game. Why do you think they made that? Or do you think they always had planned to make that announcement there? Um, It's a, it was such a small snippet added to the e3 reveal i feel like it might have been reactionary Mm -hmm. to how people reacted to ultra sun and moon i feel like they were like oh people aren't excited about ultra sun and moon as we hoped let's reassure them and let them know that we understand that pokemon switch is the real thing people want and just assuage their concerns and let them know it's coming Mm. Yeah, that's pretty and, much what we 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 kind of felt like. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like it's it should have been expected. We it's obvious that Swi- the Pokemon Switch is going to come out at some point. It's just nice that we heard it officially from Nintendo. So good job. <laughs> All right, so the Splatoon two tournament. I heard of multiple people who are sold on the game after the tournament as well. So I'm happy that that's a thing. Honestly. Well, I'm being in Splatoon 2 tournament and ARMS tournament. I'm so glad that these tournament showcases exist because it's an amazing idea for Nintendo. It allows them to essentially frame their game as more competitive games in the best light possible. I like that event. Tournaments get people hyped and uh, it allows them to present their games in a, the way that they want it to be. Mm-hmm. And last but not least... Mario Odyssey. Oh, yeah. I may be in the minority regarding the theme song. I actually really like it. I don't think you're in the minority. I don't think. I thought it was great. I heard lots of people say that they just find it super catchy and uh, just very uplifting. Jump up in the air. (laughs) Jump up. Don't be scared. It's it's so catchy, Casey. It is. It's a really just feels just happy go lucky like Mario. Yeah, and I I like that it was sung by Pauline's voice actress. Apparently. Oh, okay. So I did not it's realize actually that. it's actually Pauline performing the song, and I think that just adds a layer of character to it. Singing it, pining for her ex boyfriend who left her for some floozy in the Mushroom Kingdom. <laughs> Well, oh, she's she's really gone up in the world though. She's become a yep. career woman. That's you know, right. She's become the mayor. New Donk City. Pretty, yeah. yeah, New Donk City. So, you know, she she went the the career route. That's right. Life. She didn't Instead have of, time for some blue collar plumber. <laughs> she she was she was definitely going places and she became, you know, she got power her own way instead of having to inherit it yes. as a princess. <laughs> <laughs> Good on Pauline, you rock. Uh, I like that. I like that take. I'm actually just super <laughs> enamored by the fact that there are words in a Mario song. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, I might have been a little primed into it because of Persona 5. And there's a lot of really swingy, jazzy lyric songs in Persona mm. 5. I wish you were on the episode for one reason. I would have, if you were there, I would have made a bet 
and it seemed like a long shot, but I was totally on point last the uh, last episode. Oh yeah. I we were talking about Mario Odyssey and we were discussing the ways multiplayer might be implemented. Okay. And uh, they were talking about maybe we'll have Luigi or maybe there's something like that or maybe they'll do something like in Galaxy where the second player does something weird. And I was like, you know what? I bet player two is going to be the hat and they'll go be able to control the hat and support the main. And like literally I posted the episode like five minutes before they revealed that exact feature of the game at, at the uh, third day on E3. <laughs> That's hilarious. So I was like, I was dead on. If only you were here for me to make a bet with you on it. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, honestly, it makes sense. And yeah. I like that they're doing it that way. It's not just another jumping platformer. It's asymmetrical co-op in a way. And yeah. that's mm-hmm. so much fun. And uh, honestly, the gameplay itself looked fascinating. And if you remember the sheer moment when you saw the dinosaur. Oh, yeah. Then so that was Mario's hat on the dinosaur. Then realizing that Mario possesses things. It just opens up so uh, many uh, gameplay uh, op- they opportunities. They just corrected us on that. No, it is he does not possess things. Oh, it was – what was the term called? He captures them. Ah, uh, <laughs> it's perfect. Cap- Mario captures. captures things. Waka waka. <laughs> I, I, I really legit feel like this is a system seller. And I, I even at work, I know of so many people who were sold on the Switch when they saw all of the Mario Odyssey content at mm-hmm. E3. Yeah. I think uh, it's going to be great. Uh, and we will – We will be your all of your one-up girls, everyone. (laughs) Outstanding. All right. Well, thank you for the rundown, JV. I hope you got it all out of your system. Oh, we'll definitely have way more to talk about over the coming months and weeks and years. But, you know, uh, it's good for now. (laughs) I think it's time for us to shift gears into what we've actually gotten to play. So let's take a trip to playtime and talk about what we've gotten our hands on this week. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Alright, JV, this is it. We've been hyping up, we had two weeks of test punches, but now we've finally gotten our hands around arms. Or you have, at least. Yes, I have. I don't think you've gotten it quite yet. I got the wrong shipment from Amazon. Oh no, I hate (laughs) when that happens. I... And it was funny because maybe they got me back because I, I gave my lukewarm endorsement of uh, Binding of Isaac. And almost as if they taunted me with it, that's the game they sent me instead of arms. Oh, really? Like it like <laughs> haunted me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, give me a meh review, will ya? All right, here's even more of it. Uh huh. So I had to uh, send it back. I'm now waiting for them to send me arms in the mail. So I should have that in the next couple of days, though. But until then, you have the head start. So I'm going to be leaning on you to tell me all about what's been uh, going on this first week with arms, the community, and all the stuff that we hadn't seen yet in the test punches we got to do. Man, so this has really been my episode, Casey. Yeah, this is JV Spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> well,. Uh, you know, uh, I honestly, uh, ARMS has been a bit of a roller coaster for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, we've been hyping it up for quite a while. And then once the Pokemon Direct came out and Pokemon Tournament was announced, I just kind of forgot that ARMS was coming out and that it was a thing. But once ARMS is released, I picked it up and I really just can't put it down, Casey. Yeah. Literally, Man. my Switch is right next to me. Uh, <laughs> just five minutes starting from us recording, I was playing it. Uh, I'm hooked. It's legit, Casey. I, I, I'm already. I already know who I have to major because somebody just pointed this out to me. That oh yeah, obviously I have to play as the other KC Kid Cobra. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. <laughs> I, I guess that's it. I what someone said that to me in the chat. I was like, yep, that's that's accurate, and I I have a main. I don't even care if I don't even click with them. I have a main now. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just the moniker. It's perfect. Yeah. But well, yeah, we, we I, were saying there has to be now a JV. There needs to be like Justice Volt or something like that to be uh, your character. Oh, that would be so cool. I would, I would be so happy. Uh, but for now, I've been maining uh, Bark and Bite. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just because, you know, I love robots. I love Justice. My first name is literally Justice. Uh-huh. Um, and... Bark and Bite is a very tough character to play. I think he's one of the hardest characters in the game to really get good with. So he's is, is he now I know he has the little dog robot that works with him. Right, Would you Bark. consider him like kind of like a puppet character? Yeah, he is definitely a puppet character and you know those can are always uh really tricky cuz you have to keep track of two things at once. I've started to get more comfortable with being able to manipulate Bark to work with him and to allow him to position so that I can use him to jump up, spring up higher and leverage him for further attacks. But it's, it's a little tricky. How do you, how do you control him? So you don't ever actually control him directly. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to move around and whenever you do a normal punch, what, regardless of Bark's position, he's going to punch a couple, a second or two afterwards. Okay. You can dodge, you can start to block, and once you're blocking, that positions Bark in front of you, and then you can jump onto him and jump up. But there's a lot of considerations to take, like his original positioning might not allow him to get close to you enough, so you Mm -hmm. can't rely on it. And you have to really maintain whether it'd be a good idea to use him as a flanking tool, or a self-positioning tool, Mm. or a shield. There's a lot to consider for this guy. And... I think um, I uh, I like it. I like that that the game is more complicated than people really expected. Are you still playing? Are you playing with the motion or the Joy-Con or? Um, I'm not playing with the motion controls. I've been mostly playing in handheld mode, so I figured mm. that is the mode that I should probably start practicing with and getting good with. It's been a and... very vehement fight, actually. People are really getting passionate, and it's, I was surprised. Uh, according to our last weekend poll. It was almost a perfect 50-50 split with people who prefer motion or using button controls. But that's what's great about ARMS. Mm -hmm. The fact that both the motion controls and the the standard controls are somehow equally viable in their own ways speaks to just how well crafted this game is. Yeah. Like, it's, it's very rare for motion controls to be implemented well in a fighting game at least well enough that people would be comfortable maining it as their primary control scheme and each control scheme definitely has its advantages and disadvantages you can with the standard control scheme you can more snappily move left and right uh your whole character and that lets you do a few positionings that's very difficult to pull off with motion controls Mm -hmm. but with motion controls you're able to uh, move your character left and right while also angling your punches in a different direction Mm. simultaneously and that's not something that's easy to pull off with standard controls so there is a give and take for both of them and they're equally viable depending on your strategy and and play style now, which mode have you been playing mostly right now? Uh, so far, I've been just practicing Grand Prix. I haven't really gotten to delve too into the ranked mode, which I plan to at some point. I, that's a little but, surprising to me, you know, the way you usually just go straight for the online versus rankings. Oh, yeah. I feel like in this game, it, there is a definite learning curve to being good. Mm-hmm. So I immediately jumped into four difficulty Grand Prix. And it's it's kicking my butt in a lot of ways, but I'm slowly and steadily getting through it and more consistently winning and improving my gameplay there. Okay, okay. That's understandable there. And what yeah. other mo- modes, uh, were there any other modes that we didn't see in the test punch that you've gotten to see or try? Uh, I haven't gotten to try it, but I've been playing more hoops and more V-ball because okay. of the Grand Prix, of course. Wait, so how's Grand Prix work? I mean, that's is that just the one-player mode? That's the one-player mode where you go through a series of one to ten uh, fights. After a certain number of fight, standard 1v1 fights, you're thrown into a V-ball. 
I see. And you have to win b-ball. And then a couple more fights, and then you're thrown into hoops. Oh. And then you have to win hoops. And then you go in and you fight the final boss after that. Okay. Oh, how um, is the final boss? Is he someone very interesting or different or... Uh, you, you know the, they actually announced, uh, DLC, free DLC for ARMS. Oh, yes. Upcoming. It's going to be a character called Max Brass. Did you see that character, yes. Casey? Yes. Yes. So he is actually the final boss of the Grand Prix so far. Okay. I think we saw him in the original trailer for, like, the ARMS Direct, and I remember screen capping him. We saw him from, like, behind. Right, exactly. Well, as far as I can tell, he's the final boss. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably I have to beat him first. <laughs> he might be like the Shao Kahn or like yeah, the and... Shang Tsung before the Shao Kahn or something. Right, exactly. But he's going to be the next playable, downloadable character. So cool. that's going to be fun. Uh, that is one of the things we predicted. I, I always have to say, we did pretty decent in our E3 predictions because I believe we were fairly confident that they would announce at least the next upcoming characters for ARMS uh at e3 and that pretty much yeah, came true. which which happened it wasn't necessarily in the e3 presentation but it right. was at the treehouse and or yeah. around the time yeah so we did good casey yeah. we did good how is the community doing with arms right now i mean i imagine i i've seen them already getting groups together um do we have anything regular going on with that yet or do you want to uh, like I, announce i something? don't believe <laughs> I don't believe we have anything regular so far everyone's feeling out the game it's it's a game that is not immediately pick up and play um yeah okay like okay. mario kart that's true. it does take a little bit of getting used to the control scheme and, and the mechanics of it and it's, but we're definitely gonna start doing a, a few more organized gatherings for that in the future so. i really can't wait to try this out at a switch fest and use that lobby system and the matchmaking and just like keeping everyone entertained at going different... yeah just like i, I really want to try that mode out in there but uh once i get it we're, we'll definitely probably next weekend uh, we'll do some sort of at least some sort of casual event with the group. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna it's it's a lot of fun. The game has a surprising amount of depth, and I'm glad that it's not just throwaway software that Nintendo made. It's le it's legit, and I really want people to treat it as such. The surprise IP of the year. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting because people are constantly complaining about how Nintendo is sticking to their old tried and true franchises. That doesn't and make and, any and milking sense. It. Yeah. That, it really doesn't. Yeah. Evidence, Splatoon last year, ARMS this year. That's better than a lot of developers overall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll have even more to talk about once you pick up the game as well, Casey. Yes. And we start getting competitive. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's going to get to that point at some point. But I have not been idle this week. I have gotten my hands on a preview copy of Death Squared, which is a, I want to call it a portal style, just in theme, kind of puzzle game. It's a co-op puzzle game. So it kind of fits in the same genre as something like Snipper Clips. But right. Yeah, but you and – well, there, I, I, I can only talk about right now the one-player story mode right now. So I can't get into the details of the other modes yet. But as far as the one-player mode goes, you have two of these little wheelie robots. They're like little squares. And you control each one of them with a different joystick. So the left might control the blue one. The right might control the red one. And – that's really all they can do is move around and you have to solve puzzles to get them each on their appropriately colored end point uh, through these puzzly stages. Right. But there's death. There's a reason it's called death squared because it is like exponential number of just everything you do will cause one of these two robots to either careen off or be spiked or blow up or something like that. And they set up these death traps everywhere. Like, they'll just be a thing where on one of the stages, there's blocks. They move in sync with, let's say, the red guy. And they don't even let you see it very clearly. But as soon as you move the red guy, like, the first thing you do is like, all right, I'm going to move him to the left. Oh, well, that moves a block that pushes the right guy the, the the blue guy off the ledge and he dies in the first five seconds you play the stage. Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. And there's all these death traps uh, that are, are placed about. But it's a pretty good little puzzle game where you figure out how to angle things or, or maneuver. Right. So, like, there's, like, lasers that 
don't kill the red guy, but they can kill the blue guy. So you have to move them in sync so that the red's always blocking that laser beam. And I can already see that when this, because this will go up to four player multiplayer. And right. that's where I could just see total insanity and lots of like almost, what's that, space team? That level. Yeah, space team. Yeah, that chaos level. Chaos and, and, and <laughs> yeah. franticness. Um, I, I've seen this game played at, uh, preview events like at PAX South or at South by Southwest. And whenever people are playing it, they always look like they're having a ton of fun. So this is a game that I feel like is going to be another great party game uh, among a very certain type of crowd. Yes, right. And uh, it does have a pretty good sense of humor. They have uh, – uh, it's the, – the, I guess the premise of the story is there's some guy at whatever technology company, Omnicorp, and he's just at his desk and you hear him talking to an AI the whole time. And he's just there to observe and watch because the robots are supposedly like AIs that he's testing for their problem solving right. abilities. And him and the computer have witty banter here and there. It's yeah. similar, like I said, to Portal in the type of humor. Not as – Right. Yeah. <laughs> Not as like, like dark as that game, but it's fun. Yeah. But I feel like it, it, a Portal is a, actually a pretty valid comparison for this game. Uh, Death Squared feels like an isometric four-player uh, Portal puzzle. Yeah, right, right. It, it's the por- a Portal-style puzzle. So uh, it, it definitely uh, we'll, we'll hear more about that in the future. Yes, I think it's coming out in July. So we will be able to talk more about it as the release date approaches. And I'm going to try to beat the one-player mode. I'm halfway through it, I think, about now. And, oh, we'll see. Maybe I'll hit a wall. Who knows? And then, as soon as I can, I will tell you about the multiplayer once that embargo has been lifted. (laughs) All right. So, that is our games that we've been playing. Honestly, um, it's been a fun week, and we got a lot going ahead for us. So, let's just get to the news rundown and just catch up on a few of the little things that were announced post-E3 that have been happening. All right, so the news rundown, and probably the most interesting thing that hit this week was the 3.0 update for your Switch operating system. And this just had a bunch of little features that may have some effect on some of you, and maybe most of you it won't matter, but we'll go through it all the same. Yeah, let's go through it. All right, well, actually, this is kind of interesting because a lot of people always post on our Facebook group, hey, I'm looking to add friends. And, and, and a, we have a friend list that you can always find in the show notes of these podcasts. So if you're looking to add friends, do that. But some new ways to add friends, you can now add, if you had a Wii U friend list or a 3DS friend list, you can add all of those now just by linking your account or whatever or using your yep. Nintendo account. So you go to my page in the top left of the home menu and then click on friend suggestions. It's actually pretty handy and I didn't realize that some of the friends that I had on the Wii U and the 3DS had switches. Oh, well, there so you go. <laughs> yeah. it was convenient. That's pretty convenient. And you can now see exactly if you want. You can see when your friends go online. So I can quickly start harassing JV to join me in a multiplayer match. And you, for some reason now you can connect a USB keyboard to the Switch. Uh, I'm guessing it's just added functionality so that you can fill out forms on the Switch or, you know, fill out fields. The only time I ever would probably use it, I actually take it out of the dock because whenever I have to put in my password for the uh, eShop, I just take it out of the dock and type in my password manually like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it honestly makes sense, though. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just added functionality. Uh, you have a Wii U Pocket controller? Uh, yeah, I do. I have two. <laughs> okay. So then you're going to take use of the fact that you can now connect that to your Switch with this update. Yeah, it's it's really cool, and I read about that. It's interesting because the Pokemon Tournament controller is a legit good controller. It feels sturdy in your hand. The buttons are responsive, and I feel like this is uh, the Pokemon Tournament controller would be great for fighting games overall in the future. Mm-hmm. In fact, I believe the Pokemon Tournament controller would be great for something like Street Fighter oh, yeah. or 
you know, pocket rumble. That's true. And yes, it can work for other games too. So that's definitely an option if anyone has it tinkering around somewhere. Right. Uh, I think a pretty cool little feature. I don't see a need for this yet personally, only because I, but I can totally see this being something a lot of people need is the option to find a detached Joy-Con somewhere and just, you can basically from the controller menu in the game. I guess you would need at least one of your two Joy-Cons to access the menu. But yeah. once you go there, you can tell it to kind of tell the Joy-Cons that have been uh, paired with it before to buzz so you can hear the buzzing and find, like, oh, I left it in the couch again. Yeah, it's it's a feature that may not be necessary, but it's it's nice to have regardless. I think so. it's going to save a few people... Like ninety dollars. There's gonna be a few people oh. out there whose cats knocked it under a couch and don't know where it is. Yeah, uh, that's totally probably gonna to happen at some point. And for those of you who like messing around with the icon options, there are six new Splatoon icons to choose from. Though I am fairly adamant with my me and the different poses that you can put the me in, but uh, a lot of people like the icon. So there's six more for you to choose from. Yeah, now. yeah. First Splatoon two. The original ones were. Primarily Splatoon 1. So. Right, right. That's Good true. Good stuff. Um, similar in the, not related to that update, but uh, also a OS kind of uh, new feature is there is now a, uh, in the news feed, not necessarily a, they don't call it a like or dislike buttons. They call, I'm sorry, it's a great and a, oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. With a little broken heart <laughs> next to it. So it's basically, tell, you can say whether you like or dislike certain news articles on the feed. Yeah, and I I th- I don't think there's a specific purpose for it quite yet. Yeah. But it's a way for Nintendo to gather data on what people are interested in seeing in the news section and what they aren't. So, yeah. Perhaps it's it's, you know, it, it doesn't hurt. Right. It's yeah, and it's it, something it, you can completely ignore regardless. Right. It's something for them I yeah, I doubt they're going to stop, you know, sharing information they want you to get just because you don't like certain ones. But yeah, they will get an idea of, okay, maybe we'll focus on these kind of stories. Or maybe we'll stop sending these kind of stories that everyone doesn't like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Level 5 is trying to find a way to put the Layton series on the Switch. I feel like it shouldn't be that difficult, honestly. The, the, the Layton games aren't really technically required. They, it doesn't require that much graphics capabilities mm-hmm. and cpu power so the only think- thing they stated that might be a hitch they have to figure out is the fact that when it's docked there is no touch screen oh okay so they want to make sure they're able to figure out puzzles that don't require a touch screen or or perhaps they will say you know what maybe this is a touch screen only game maybe you know it, it like a uh, voice maybe it has to be in you know, handheld mode to play it. Um, you know, yeah, something like that. Or like you said, maybe we'll just have to find a way that it doesn't rely on that. But that is kind of a core part of how the latent series has worked. So it's uh, it's hard to say how they'll go with that. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But I feel like if anyone's going to be able to figure this out, it's going to be level five. Yeah, it does. It just does, it does sound like because they were kind of standoffish in the past. It just sounds like before they were like, well, let's see how good the switch does before we say what we're going to make for it. It sounds like now they're like, all right, uh, things look good. So we want to now try to figure out how to make this work. And someone else who in the similar lines, EA, after the successful launching of their FIFA game is now looking to bring other uh, of their properties over to the Switch. They kind of, you know, they just basically said in in an interview that the the Switch is taking off and that we want to now work with Nintendo and find other things that'll fit there, especially things that take advantage of the portability mode because they said that Nintendo Switch players, you know, it's a very specific kind or it's a different kind of audience and we want to bring things over that accommodate or fit that audience. Right. They they are very specific in bringing up the fact that there are player differences mm-hmm. on the Nintendo Switch, which, you know, I'm a little iffy on because, you know, we're, we're all gamers and the Nintendo Switch is trending towards adult yeah. owners. So I don't think they really have to work on on catering to a younger or a younger audience. So No, I see what you're saying. That makes a lot of sense. It's not like 
we're a very different type of gamer, right? We're just, yeah. you know, we're ones who have this system and we have one extra trick that other consoles don't have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're just gamers, but we just happen to have a console that allows us to play portably. Mm-hmm. Another Hori headset is uh, set for July. And again, it's, it's it kind of has that same setup as the last one we saw. The uh, was the Splatoon themed one. This yeah, one doesn't have the, that with theme. The, yeah, but this one still has an adapter that hooks up to both your uh, smartphone and the Switch. So I guess Hori, that's Hori's thing now. Yeah, I guess so. And you know, but that's their solution. Still, we have no information on how that app's going to work. So it's still weird yeah. to like, have this device that we don't even know how it's going to work with that thing. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. And just in case anyone wasn't 100% clear on what they were saying, because some people were like, you know, reading really far into the wording of that Pokemon announcement from E3 about the mainline game. Uh, Reggie just spelled it out for us in an interview that, and I quote, the Pokemon game for Switch is a traditional find, battle, train type experience. It's not going to be some new spin on the series. It's going to be that kind of... I still suspect there's going to be some very interesting twist or addition to the series because this is a big new system for it to go to and a console. But it's going to be what you expect a Pokemon mainline game to be. So um, it seemed like some people might have expected the Pokemon Switch game to be more in line with Pokemon Stadium or yeah. Battle Coliseum, or even a little bit neutered like Pokemon XD and Pokemon uh, for the GameCube Pokemon games. Mm-hmm. And Reggie, I'm glad Reggie was able to just clear that up and, and say, no, it's going to be legit. Right, right. Because, yeah, we, we, we think of this as every other console Pokemon game they've made, they've done something off, you know, off the... Off, off standard. Yeah, off standard. Which, you know, they served a certain purpose, but they always were there to supplement the 3DS or the, 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 the portable games. Yeah, they're able to confirm that this is the real deal. This yeah. is going to be the primary platform that you're going to play the Pokemon game on. Yeah. All right. So um, next up, I guess you would call this a, a I don't know if this is like an, a, a learn to code platform called Fuse Code Studio. And it is for the Nintendo Switch. And it is basically a... You know, a way to learn how to program on the Switch platform for any of the budding designers out there who might want to maybe make their own game in the future. This is a uh, application or a program that will get you started and maybe help the next generation of homebrew games if that is something that could come in the future down the line. I'm actually looking at screenshots here, and I love that they have... You know, while loops and if else statements and prints, print. Uh, I it's really cool that they're making a coding game for young young kids to learn how to to make programs. This is so in my line. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I think that's one of those things that um, I don't know if it's different in other countries, but I just think coding in general is just one of those very vital core skills that I think should just be something that you start learning in like elementary school, even just like learning basic coding. Cause it's such a, I don't know, it, it's such a valuable and in, important skill that I think anyone could use. And just something like this even would be a good way to contribute to that uh, learning process as early as possible. Yeah. It, the fact that you can code your own games is it's something that you actually do in high school and college level coding uh, classes. So having it in this little app and having it guided through a Fuse's program seems like a great idea. Mm-hmm. A few a little future look at what Minecraft has in store. And with the Better Together update, this actually sounds like a big deal in that they're going to be adding the cross-platform play and i believe right now this will only be again this is like not with sony it sounds like so it's going to be basically switch microsoft uh, xbox and pc that's really cool that you guys are finally able to get some cross-platform play Mm -hmm. and that nintendo who is normally kind of walled in is 
participating in this clock fa- platform uh, capability. Yeah. And now, tell I'm not sure if I understand this right. It mentions also that they're going to have servers on the consoles. Does that mean that Rin doesn't have to keep her system on whenever other people want to play on her game? Yeah, it looks like, finally, servers are actually going to be available in console games. Uh, This isn't quite as open as Minecraft Realms, where people are just hosting their own private servers and letting people have access to it and having their own controls. It looks like these servers are a lot more curated with a lot of parental controls, but the fact that servers are going to be available on the console platform is a big deal. Okay, very cool. I, very yes. Cool. Yeah, so it allows people to have a persistent world uh, without requiring a single person to to host it. Okay. If this is going to be hosted by... Mojang? Mo, Mo, Mo Yang? Mo Yang. Mo Yang. It's going to be hosted by the Minecraft people themselves. <laughs> badeet, 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 that's all, folks. Uh, yep. <laughs> um, and they also showed off one little thing of the Super Duper Graphics Pack that will be coming out. And, you know, it's it's what it sounds like. It's a lot of little extra um, graphical upgrades, still keeping it in that boxy style. Um, Switch doesn't get the full 4K graphics of this, but it's going to have a lot of the other little bells and whistles and... Uh, other little upgrades to the textures just to make the game look a little less plain and 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 uh flat you know it just it just adds yeah. a little more depth and uh, and uh detail to the blocks yeah it looks like it's having super duper graphics yes right um we got a release date for Xenoball <laughs> Xenoball Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2 and that's going to be coming out September 7th in Japan but the other thing and I, I'm I, I'm calling. I think this is a little bit set up, but it's still a fun way to get people to kind of rally behind the game. Uh, they yeah. did not announce Dragon Ball Fighter Z for the Switch, so we didn't talk about it before. But this did look awesome. Did you see this game at E3? I did. It looks it looks like a 2D Dragon Ball Z fighting game. That kind of pulls its engine and mechanics from Marvel vs. Capcom. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really interesting and kind of cool, and uh, I love to see it on the Switch. Yeah, and they they said it's – so even though they didn't announce it for the Switch, they have announced that if the fans show enough interest, they said they will bring it to the Switch. And even to back this up a little further – the voice of Vegeta himself went on Twitter and said that, I quote, as a bona fide Switch fan, I support this movement. Retweet! And he called to arms for people to um, harass Bandai Namco to bring this game to Switch. Yeah. Um, very cool grassroots movement. I hope it actually gains traction. Yes. What, as much as I think that this was, you know, I, they totally intend to bring it to Switch... I think that they know it's it, it's a fun way to play off of the enthusiasm of the Nintendo fan base that you probably couldn't do with most other consoles reliably. And yeah, yeah just I getting agree. them to like cheer and to retweet to get this game coming over to it. But it does look really I, – I love the way they do the – because it's the three-on-three battles, like the King of Fighters yeah. style. And I just love the way, like, as soon as one guy gets knocked out, they cut right into that animation of the new fighter coming in and clashing with the, the winner of the last match. Right. And that kind of reminds me of Marvel vs. Capcom. And I Oh, think they do do that, too. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, somewhat similarly. But, oh. um, yeah, it's it looks great. The animations look great. And I'm glad that they're bringing a 2D fighting game back for Dragon Ball Z. Very, Very cool. cool stuff. There's a dodgeball arena game coming out next month called Rocket Fish. Um, Rocket Fist. I'm sorry, Rocket Fist. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> what it's called. And then there's a, a bullet hell shooter called Don Maku Unlimited 3 hitting the eShop later this year. It's only announced for Japan, but as a bullet hell shooter, you really don't need to, uh, you know, know the language have that much text yeah, yeah. i think that it's, it's mostly menus yeah I, I i think this will be a totally viable game just to get off their eShop, whether or not it comes here and uh i will not bother with the legend of bumbo because i didn't even show the gameplay to that game so and yeah that's all that we have for the news the new releases for this week have been 
ACA Neo Geo Sengoku. So yeah, I believe uh, Sengoku is a type of Double Dragon style beat 'em up game. Okay, and of course, Arms came out this week, so we'll have plenty of that to play. Uh, Cave Story Plus is available as well as Mighty Gunvolt Burst. And for fans of Zelda-like adventure games, Oceanhorn will be hitting the eShop today, the day this podcast is uploaded. All of these games are available on the eShop, and uh, Arms and Cave Story are also available in retail. All right, let's uh, hit up the community pulse and uh, call it a night, shall we? All right, let's go. Alright, so starting with Aldrin Cornejo, it's years away, but what if the Switch Pokemon would let us do the secret base thing again, only this time we're the gym leaders, or the hench people of our friends as gyms? It would also be awesome if all regions were available. Ooh. Now, I, I honestly don't expect them to ever release a game where all regions are available, mm-hmm. unless it's like an MMO uh-huh. Pokemon game. But a side mode like secret bases or gyms, that's totally feasible on the Switch. And it's it's nothing that's limited by technology, so why not? The only thing, I, I, and I, I do think this would be an awesome idea, especially the idea of building it, customizing it like your secret base. Um, it yeah. feels like something that would make a perfect like street pass sort of thing, kind of like what they did yeah. with Fire Emblem, where you customized your castle and you put your character... And like the throne to defend and all the, you know, your, your characters to, def- you know, fight off invaders. It feels like it would be like that and it would be even easier. And then it'd be like, Hey, JV, I want you to be the third guy they have to fight and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, no, that sounds like a really cool idea. I like it. Yeah. Let's go for it. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, Robert Anduhar wrote, what game changer would you want to see in a Nintendo game? Whether it's a new or replacing mechanic. A change in genre, thematic tone, etc. for any series in particular, though I'm mainly asking about Pokemon. <laughs> All right. Pokemon's pretty popular in our community pulse. Yes, Who it most certainly would have guessed. Uh, game changing change of the way things are played. Um I have always said I want to see more co op stuff for Pokemon. It's something they've never really done. I guess the closest is the two V two battles. But I think teaming up and having like challenges that require like three or four players to overcome together would be uh, the kind of thing I'd love to see that series do. I would love to see maybe some sort of Pokemon raiding or Pokemon dungeons that you can run with uh, with people in a co-op mode. And perhaps there could be rare Pokemon or items at the very end of that dungeon. That might be something that that would really take off on the Switch. Yeah. Are you liking? Are you excited about the Pokemon Go updates? Oh, I'm so excited about that! So, 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 so and... when are we doing our Pokemon Go podcast? Come on! No. Oh, PogoCast! <laughs> Next episode, we're done. Yeah. We're, we're <laughs> doing PogoCast from now on. <laughs> anyway, so moving on so from Joel Blazer, will there be something like homebrew on the Switch? Yes, at some point, I will. I can guarantee that homebrew is going to be something on the Switch. Yep. It, it's just inevitable, but we'll, we'll see how widespread it becomes. And if you want to help it, you know, maybe start showing people off that the Fuse application and start you know, having people learn how to code on the Switch. Once people start learning how to code on it, they'll start making more games. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> Joe Lockhart wrote, Likelihood of Mario Party for the Switch with online multiplayer? Um, I never really thought of Mario Party as a game that would make sense with online multiplayer. It's really, it's like playing karaoke online. It's, it's, it's about the local social kind of aspect. It doesn't, doesn't seem as exciting to have it online. Not that it wouldn't have it, but it doesn't really feel like something that it goes with that, that game particularly. Right. Um, I can see the appeal of having your friends on voice chat while you play Mario Party, but I don't see it as being a priority for Nintendo in the future. Right, right. So I, I, it's dubious. I doubt it. Anyway, so from Tony Lyons, 
Have you done the Arms Grand Prix on level 7 yet? No, I have not. I'm barely surviving Grand Prix on level 4. <laughs> Once I get to the point where I can do Grand Prix on level 7, I feel like I'm just good at that point. I don't think I'm near that skill level quite yet. Awesome. No, it's something to aspire to. So, I mean, it's only been a couple of days, and if you could beat level 7 yet... It would probably mean the game's a little too easy, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you haven't beaten it yet on that level. Yeah, apparently level four is when it starts to get really rough mm. and, and difficult. So apparently I just hopped into level four without even really getting into the game. So <laughs> okay. I'm starting off rough and I'm beating myself up for it. <laughs> and with that... Don't, 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 beat, don't beat yourself up anymore, JV. You should go rest and heal up. Because that's the last yes. thing for this episode. And I want to thank everybody for listening. And I think this is a good time to remind everybody, especially our new listeners who might not know, we have a Patreon. If you like this show and you came back from last week to listen to this week also, just consider, just throwing it out there, visiting patreon.com slash the switchcast. That's where you can support this show and you can pledge a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars a month to help us make more shows, to do more types of things with the show, pay for our servers, maybe get into some video streaming, all that kind of great stuff. And there's even some rewards that we are working on. We had some hangups, but believe me, we are working on getting those rewards out as soon as possible. If you go down there and you can see what those rewards are, they range from t-shirts to shout outs on the show, like the one you heard at the beginning of this one, and some special little honors on our Discord chat. Speaking of which, we have a Discord chat. It's where- Segway! <laughs> it's where there's at least 50 plus of us who are on there at a daily basis and it's a very awesome and relaxed place to come anytime just to chat about Switch stuff, some other things. It's a cool group. No trolls allowed. Have fun. Come down there. There's a link to that in the show notes if you want to join us. You can also go and say nice things about us on the Apple Podcast app or the Google Play Store or wherever you found this podcast. Go and leave us a five-star review because that helps us go up in the rankings so more people can hear us and we can spread our awesomeness around. And if you have anything you want to say to me or JV, you can email us casey at the switchcast.com or jv at the switchcast.com. Uh, speaking of which, don't forget we also have a Twitter account. So it's at the switchcast on Twitter. Uh, same with Instagram. It's also at the switchcast on Instagram. We post up quite a few pictures regularly from the community and it's a really fun Instagram to follow. We have a booming Facebook group for the SwitchCast itself. Uh, we also have a SwitchCast friends list. We talked about this at the start of the episode. If you want to add more friends to play multiplayer games on your Nintendo Switch, check out our friends list. It's going to be on the show notes. Uh, and I guess in the end, thank Essa for the music. And until next time, switch it up.